Hi, everybody. I think it's on. Um, because we have such a packed schedule, I'm going to go ahead and start us right at noon. So first of all, I want to welcome you all to the um, National Leadership Conference. I'm really excited that you decided to come a little bit early and join this pre-conference. I'm Danielle Prati. I'm the Vice President for Quality with VNAA. And I'm very excited to get this session started here today. Um, increasingly, we have conversations across industry about our workforce. Where are they going to come from? What is happening? How do we generate them? How do we keep them? How do we grow them? And a million other questions that are surrounding our workforce and home-based care. So today is really VNAA's beginning of engaging in this conversation. And um, I'm really excited to welcome you all. We do plan on building on this conference and continuing this conversation over time. So um, I have some housekeeping details to get started. Um, this session is being recorded, so for the speakers in the room, please try and remember to speak into a microphone, one of the two. Um, it is approved for three and a half contact hours by the Maryland Nurses Association, an accredited approver of, by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certification of completion, you need to intend, attend the program in its entirety, complete the evaluation available at the conference app. I hope you all have downloaded the app. Um, certificates of completion are available at the registration desk. Our faculty for today's event has disclosed no financial conflict of interest, and a copy of the full disclosure sheet was available when you signed in. I think most of you picked it up if you do want to see that. So today we have a number of presenters that are going to be helping us look at workforce um, issues from a variety of perspectives, and we're going to be starting with the team from the Visiting Nurse Association of Northern New Jersey. We have um, Faith Scott joining us today. She's been a leader in home health care industry for more than 20 years. Faith has joined the Visiting Nurse Association of Northern New Jersey as president and CEO. At the time, the organization was near bankrupt. Um, with Faith's leadership, combined with support from the Board of Trustees and guidance from multiple business partners, she turned VNANNJ, it's a lot of initials, into a fiscally sound organization with forward thinking vision that is responsive to current and future markets. She is joined on the podium today by Lisa Salomon. She is a leader in the nonprofit home care industry also for more than 20 years. She began her career as a community relations assistant for a local nonprofit and in 2000 joined the Visiting Nurse Association of Northern New Jersey as director of development. In that role, Lisa raised more than $5 million in capital, endowment, and operating in pro for capital endowment, operating, and program service needs. She secured a federal congressional award for over $400,000 and was responsible for the agency receiving the largest bequest in its history. Lisa has advanced her position in the foundation to executive vice president and chief operating officer, a role that she's held for nine years. Lisa and Faith are going to talk to us about an overall model for workforce development, and I hope that you'll help me welcome them to the podium. Okay, so if I speak with this, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think I'm going to come down simply because it's easier for me to see you. And uh, I'm Faith. And really what I want to do today is something a little bit different. Uh, Lisa and I coming on the plane here last evening, we had an in-depth discussion for three and a half hours about how to improve staffing. And here we are presenting before you with samples of things that we believe have been successful. And we identify staffing as a strong priority 
and a significant pain point for all of the business that we're in. So in order to take it to the next level, our organization believes in looking at case studies issued by the Harvard Business Review from outside industries, and we try to steal and copy whatever we can. So for healthcare, that's a little bit unusual. I'm going to talk to you about Netflix, and I'm going to talk to you about Google, and Lisa will talk to you about the tactics, what we really do on the visiting nurses. But I want to engage you so that you don't say, I came in and I'm trying to figure out what to do. I want you to get your mindset appreciating other industries operate differently than we can. And Lisa was strong last night, and we had no wine, where she said, but we can't afford all of that, like when we were talking about ideas. So what we're going to present is perhaps lofty, but it is really just to get you thinking. It is an example of way other industries have been successful. And yes, I recognize in full disclosure, we are not a Google or a Netflix. So here we go. Okay, so in January of 2015, the CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings, announced that he was going to change his industry. He made all of his money on selling DVDs. Now he stream a uh, streaming service online for music. At the time, they ranked number 11 on top attractors in the US in terms of employers. And this is their philosophy, it's underlined there. That they emphasize top pay for top performance and they have generous severance for those who don't make the cut. So what that really means is we try really hard to keep everyone who's productive in a high level way and we get rid of everyone who's not. So I think that's lesson number one. In healthcare, we don't always do that. Employees unanimously, upon evaluation, say, what is it that you like about Netflix? I'm among awesome colleagues. Okay, so that you can think about, right? By the way, they recognize they are a cutthroat industry. So some of the highlights, high performance, freedom, responsibility, context, not control, Pay top of market, promotion and development. You would all say those are all good things. Attracting talent. This was very fascinating to me, that they recruit what they call and define fully developed talent, fully formed adults. We went on discussion of what is that definition. They bring it right down to, we don't take people out of college. And we, we in my organization, believe in taking people out of college. We have a new grad program. They will tell you the successes of it. But really, you're looking for a mature uh, ability to perform high performance in these people. And they want people to be self-sufficient. So no hand-holding. We create the structure. We give you the freedom. We give you the accountability. We give you the pay. And we let you go. There's no vacation policy. That's a little bit scary to me, right? We have all of these people that have to make visits and uh, they are able to schedule their vacation as long as they can clear it through their managers. If they need to go back to India because it's a long distance, they can go for six weeks. I find that increasingly interesting. I don't know how we would manage it, but no annual employee reviews. I thought, wow, that's good. I'd like to work there. And a five-word expense policy that says, act in our best interest. So my goodness, that could be anything. Responsible people thrive on freedom and are worthy of freedom. So we are not, again, babysitting. We are not dummying down our staff. We are not hand-holding. We are not creating rules that are constantly difficult to maintain. The context is not to control our people, to let our people understand the philosophy at which they operate in and to move the projects forward within that context. So those tools are strategy, metrics, assumptions, objectives, clearly defined roles. How many of you have one person doing five jobs? 
In my organization, that's the best way. It saves me five jobs. But is it clear? Well, to me it is, but I don't know if it is to all of them. So that, that's a piece to con, you know, consider. Knowledge of the stakes, transparency. And what you want to avoid in the Netflix model is top-down decision-making, management approval for everything, committees, and pl planning and process is valued more than outcome. Any of you relate to any of this as things we do? You're a quiet group. Because it's a high core performance, outstanding employees get more done and cost less than an average employee. I think that you all, if you think about your organization, you have some star performers. And we haven't been, I know I haven't been, as successful as I'd like to be to collecting more star performers and endeavoring and making it a conscious plan and strategic direction to target outstanding people to work on your team. Promotions. We celebrate, they celebrate, self-improvement. And with that, there are um, a lot of people who are involved in many things. They are learning. They are continuously observing, introspection, reading, discussion. Stunning colleagues is where this all comes into play. And they also try to grow with each other. And there is a culture that in growing, you are honest with each other. I don't know anyone who works for Netflix, but this is what the Harvard Business Review publishes. The idea, if a company hires correctly, people will want to excel and be a star. They can be managed through honest communications and common sense. Most companies focus too much on formal pro policies aimed at the small number of employees who just don't get it. So we manage the workforce by managing the small percentage of problem employees. And that doesn't align necessarily with a futuristic organization. The solution, as written by Netflix, hire, reward, and tolerate only fully formed adults. Tell the truth about performance. Don't sugarcoat it. Make the expectations out there and pay them when they get them. Make clear to managers that their top priority is building teams. And create a company culture, if you're a leader, that fosters this and talent managers should think like innovative business people instead of HR. So that's that um, case study. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't look at Google because everyone knows about Google. You all use Google, you think Google, you hear about the people who go to Google and they dress very casually, you hear about all the coffee they get to drink, and all of the, they get haircuts on uh, premises as well. So we thought we should talk about them. So here, case study number two. It is a multinational technology company specializing in internet-related services and products. That basically means everything. Um, they were founded in only 1996. Most of us were found at the end of 1800s or early 1900s. So Google has accomplished a little bit more in less time. So I don't know if that has any indication of how our industry needs to change, but I'll just highlight that point. Um, they have been on the Fortune 500 list for many years for top employer. They have been nominated to be the world's most attractive employer in 2010. And uh, to graduating students, they are one of the most sought out places to go work. The corporate philosophy, philosophy is you can be serious without a suit. I love this one. You can make money without being evil. I, I want to say that again. Home health gets kicked in the self itself all the time because of all of the illegal allegations that occur in certain states. Whereas here, they put it right there, out there. Work should be challenging and challenges should be fun. So uh, there are other studies that document how much time in a person's life they spend in work. Uh, and those studies are pretty impressive when you look at a work culture if they don't like their work, or if they are not rewarded, or if they are not happy, or they are not productive, they have spent more than 50% of their time in their life unhappy. So 
I can't be responsible for people's happiness, but I can be responsible for creating an incentive with good principles that inspire people and make my bottom line more successful. So that's how we kind of try to boil it down. Here are um, some other elements that Google uh, did, and this is where we were discussing you need resources. So of course they have analytics, they have predictive models, they can tell you what um, of their potential staff that are there, who will be a leader, who will have problems. And so we were trying to boil this down. What might those things be? The things that we identified in our organization, not in Google, what happens when a person starts to call out sick? What happens when a person goes down to HR and says, can I have a copy of my transcript or a copy of last year's evaluation or a copy of my vaccines that you gave me? Well, we know that those are pain points, but we haven't measured them. So the way we were taking the algorithm that they propose in their world out to our world is, what if we captured the data of all of those points that we know cause problems with turnover. And it happened to four people out of five. And each person left their employment four months earlier than you wanted. That's a whole year, a year plus of a full-time staff. So we don't have the key metrics, but what we as an industry are challenged to do is identify the key metrics that help us see when people are going to turn over, help us see what creates good leadership, helps us to predict it before we say, it's summertime, everybody who wants to quit always does. Does that happen in any of your organizations? No, everybody's happy in the summertime? There's no shortages? No one's responding, so I'm guessing you're all in a perfect place. Um, also, the retention algorithm, it's math. It's how many people you have, how many people get days off, how many people get uh, salary adjustments, how many people are on par with the market, how many people are under, I mean, you can measure anything. I'm not here to tell you what the algorithm is. In each organization, the culture will be different. Each region of our country is different. So there's no real algorithm. The lesson to steal from Google is you need to measure the meaningful things that you as leaders know create an opportunity for you to nip it in the bud. And your challenges are small. Challenges of time you're trying to recapture. So if everyone's going to turn over in two years, your benchmark is you want them to get to two years. If they all leave at 18 months, you've lost money in those last six. So what are the pain points? Now, Lisa, woman of reason, pointed out, sometimes those people are so problematic, we want them to go. Well, then we didn't get the predictive screening right to the best of our ability at the beginning because we don't want to be there. Now, again, this is very ideal. It is not contemporary necessary to all the shortages that you're dealing with, but it's to help you think about a different model. And um, here, they, they say nicely, predict who's going to be a retention problem. So, you, you know, again, it's math. So you have to think about this. The next thing, um, predictive modeling is something our industry does not do a lot of. But businesses do it all the time. It's taking variables that are significant. It's tested for sensitivity. And I can use you an example to help you appreciate this. We know that episodes of care with case mixes has a strong correlation, 95% accuracy, to what we'll make. So we do a predictive model based on our historical performance, based on our projections going forward. The same math model is done for HR elements, which can be translated to dollars in all areas. It's just a matter of building the forecast and getting someone to help you do it who builds these models. But it's not that complicated. Um, and then, of course, an effective algorithm in hiring. And so when we were preparing for this presentation, we said, well, we have a process, we have things that get scored, Lisa's going to tell you about a predictive tool that we use, and all of those things you know, are good, they're in place, they help us, they're structure. 
But we also recognize that there are behaviors that we haven't screened for successfully that we can measure. And if, if you leave with nothing else from my presentation, it's really trying to measure and create data for yourself. And in the beginning, you create silly data because it doesn't make sense. But if you don't create the data and collect the data and ask yourself, what does it tell us? How does it make a change? How do we create a benchmark? You have to start somewhere. So that's really, Google has mastered it, and we as an industry need to consider uh, adapting to some of those skills. Calculating the, the value of top performers. In your own head, you know what you pay people. If you lost one of those people that you thought was a strong performer, what would the impact be? Now, when you're looking at your market and your salary, you're giving them 2%, 3%, whatever's in your budget. Is there an incentive plan to incentivize them to go a little bit further? So when you collect your recollection of the year, you say, God, we did well, considering A, B, C, D, E. Doesn't mean that your performance was off the chart. It means you got through maybe some difficult times, but you had key performers. You have to recognize that. You have to recognize, are you paying them fairly? And I'm a nurse by training. I have two, almost two graduate degrees. I'm graduating uh, in May with my second graduate degree. And people have told me for years, it's a calling. I don't mean to offend any nurse. I work for a living. I need to pay for college like anybody else who doesn't work for a calling. I don't want to work for a calling. I want to work for money. So again, that may sound harsh. I'm being a little bit harsh to illustrate to you the value and put it into perspective. And then your workplace, the culture of your workplace drives collaboration. One of the key elements that Google said was really um, game-changing was that the people who came to work who were top performers, who were interesting, who could take vacation whenever they wanted, who could come casually, worked a lot of hours. That one doesn't seem consistent with another. At the same time, what is it that they liked? They engaged in collaborating interesting projects. There are many projects in our organization, and Lisa will touch on this, where we have engaged different level people. We have nurses who do PowerPoints on the changes in wound management, and they are proud of it. And um, would we have expected that before? They present to a team, they conduct a round table, but I don't want to go into the next session, section, uh, Lisa will go into that. But the point is creating engagement, creating collaboration, empowering your team to create those projects, and rewarding your top performers so that they go and work even further. All of our people, by the way, are salaried. So if someone says to me, I'd like to work four hours on Sunday, is that OK? I say, you can work seven days a week. It's OK with me. Don't ask me. It, it's fine. It's the culture. Similarly, if they make appointments personally and they're taking care of something that I don't really need to know what it is, it doesn't matter. They make it up. So again, that's workplace work design. Increasing discovery and learning. If you have a stale environment and all we focus on is regulatory changes, it's kind of a downer, right? Our industry is a struggling, tough industry. But in, within that, there are great opportunities to create this collaboration, to let people to grow, to let people get excited, and not always feel like the downtrodden business. Also, without data, you can't talk. As an industry, we are weak at the table because we don't have data. And we do a lot to say we should do this, we should do that. We need data. Anyone who's involved in the HR side, it's difficult to quantify. We don't get good rates if I can't report some of my data. 
and why I have lost things. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, but it's not a dictation, it's let data speak. So Google, when they have projects, they allow teams of people to price projects out and to propose them with data. Data's convincing. It's very difficult to say no if the data speaks to it. So that's just another consideration. And now I introduce Lisa Salamone, my colleague, one of my valued employees, and she will tell you what we actually do. May I? Oh, I am um, going to stand. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm going to stand here at the podium because I think I can see better up here. Um, but And thank you for the kind introduction, Faith. I would love to say that we can implement all of the things that Google and Netflix has introduced. And after hearing all of the things and working with Faith on this, I get to my section, I say, wow, we're really not as sassy as the rest, but we work within the resources that we have and we try to really make, uh, hold a position that we are investing in our employees and that we are providing some engagement for them to have succession within their field and with what they love to do. So with that, I will tell you, a, oops, tell you a little bit about the VNA. So we are a nonprofit organization. We're a post-acute provider serving the northern New Jersey region of New Jersey. We provide home health. We provide hospice, adult day, private care, respite, and other community-based programs. We have about a 1,200 patient average daily census to give you some perspective. Um, we do offer a new grad nurse program, as Faith alluded to, and we do also offer a clinical ladder within our organization, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as uh, we continue here. So I just want to go back a little bit to give you some perspective on why did we take a look at our workforce? Why were we so um, driven to look for other innovative um, methods to inspire our staff and to retain our staff? Um, it was about five years ago in 2012. And if I were to say to you, we hit rock bottom in our workforce, it, it, that's really giving it some kudos. Like we hit rock bottom. We, there were nursing shortages, unmotivated staff, disinterested managers, high caseloads, low productivity, people lo looking for stipends, looking for overtime opportunities. It was at every turn we were knocking ourselves against the wall. We had nurses that were turning over very quickly. They were not motivated to produce and they would move on. So it was, it was a severe call to leadership. We had to really take a close look and say, what would inspire our staff? What would attract top talent? And I don't want the C average, D average students. We were looking for B or better students. How could we build a workforce that would, would think like salaried employees? We felt that everybody that came to the table prior were really looking for a per visit type engagement and that was not what we wanted to do. We wanted people to be salaried, we wanted them to be educated, and we wanted them to be accountable to their work. So really the ultimate question was what would build investment, what would build engagement, and how would we provide professional development so they would stay? Our approach was really a five-tiered uh, approach, and it was really do everything. You could not pick one component over the other, what was important first or second. It really is a, an evolution of all five elements being, how do I invest in my workforce, selection and hiring process, what did our orientation look like for our workforce, then continued professional development for them, and what type of retention programs could we put in place to really save the organization money on starting the cycle all over again? So it was a do-it-all mentality. So in terms of our, our investment, we really had to take a look at the talent. What were we going to do in terms of our structure? And at that time, we thought we needed a clinical ladder, we needed a strong workforce. We made a very conscious decision that in that moment, we were only going to hire bachelor prepared people at every level, not just our nursing staff. If you were a receptionist at the front desk, if you were a nurse, if you're a therapist, whatever you were in the organization, you come to the table with a minimum investment of being a bachelor prepared person. We built a clinical ladder in, with uh, keeping in mind that people want to be able to advance. And in home health, 
there's not a lot of opportunity for people to advance. They're in the field, they're working day to day, they're seeing their patients. What could we do to give them something a little bit different in their work day? How could we inspire them to keep learning, looking for education opportunities, and to build some other opportunities into their, um, into their work? So we built a solid curriculum with competencies for not just our new grads, but for all staff. We aligned our fair market compensation structure with workforce development. And I really want to underscore that because while prior to doing this in 2012, we didn't read the Netflix case study at that point, but we knew if we were not paying people well, they were going to our competition down the street. There's just no question that's happening. So we had to put a compensation structure in. We hired a third party outside consultant. They came in, they looked at um, positions across the organization. They leveled them accordingly based on years of service, experience, and we put a very solid comp structure in place, and we have it reevaluated every year to make sure we're um, keeping up with that structure. And we made a real strong investment to align the right people in the right jobs, which meant people could move. It wasn't if you were hired in as a nurse, you were gonna be a field nurse forever. We were hoping people would start to look. We wanted to grow our own workforce so that we had opportunities for people to move around, both with our professional staff and our support staff. Selection and hiring. This is really a very critical moment. Of course, I'm sure you all have been at the table where you're looking to um, hire and bring people on and onboard people. Some organizations are really um, looking for experienced nursing only. Again, we took the position that we are going to hire new grads and we're gonna educate them and we're gonna build them and we're gonna keep them in our system because we have a ladder to do that. So again, it was a real investment. It's also an investment because these new grads, they're not ready day one. It takes us a full year to have a, a, a nurse new grad to be invested in our organization. And so it's an investment from them, but it's an investment on our part as well. Um, when we focus on that new grad program, I'll just give you a little example of how this goes. We do two classes per year. We do not just take new grads at random. We find they work better in classes. They're coming out of school. We put together a class of about four or five nurses, and we use our team leaders to do round table. I would like to call it speed dating, but it's really speed interviewing. They come to a table, they're interviewed by, or you know, they engage in conversation with a few team leaders at a time, and they are at that point, we have about 20 new grads that come, and we select the top five um, for a spring class and for a fall class. They do seem to work better when you pull them into groups. We even have had some of our new grad classes um, take apartments together, they go out together. We happen to be in a pretty nice area of Morris County where there's some restaurants and ways for them to bond as a team, um, even on a personal level, and that has happened. So that has really also helped as a byproduct of the program to keep people engaged in their work. Um, we have formed partnerships with universities, and I will say that in the beginning, this was not an easy um, accomplishment. It's not always easy to break into the universities and colleges. Sure, they'll invite you to a fair. They'll invite you to put a table out and pay for people to come and, and you get some access. But it is really, you have to continue to build relationships with these colleges because they have the programs and better yet, they have funding, federal funding, state funding, where they can help your program and enhance your program. We're in a partnership right now with Rutgers University they have an at-a-hospital residency po uh, program. This is a graduate program, so these are already licensed nurses that are going back for an advanced degree. We hire them, and then we partner with Rutgers to continue educating them as they go through our orientation program over the next six months. So it's really worth, worth the investment. Again, it's, it's time, it's resources, and it's worth it. Um, and as I mentioned, we do take these classes of the new grads at least uh, or twice a year. We also do one other thing on hiring and selection. As Faith mentioned earlier, we utilize a predictive index tool. 
Maybe some of you are utilizing a similar analytic, but we find it does help with the selection um, profiling. And what we know is that when people come to your organization, there's a few givens, right? There's, we know that they're coming with a minimum, because I told you we only take bachelors prepared, and they have to meet the minimum requirement of being a B student. So we're, we have educated people, they're intelligent, they have skills, Maybe they have a little experience. They all come with, you know, all of those things that you know. But what we don't know all the time when we sit before someone in an interview is what will they do at work? How will they behave? Will they be a good fit for my organization? And so we have begun maybe in the last four or five years working with a predictive index tool that really it's a valid and objective tool. It is compliant with the EEOC um, guidelines. And what it does is it tells me, um, based on certain characteristics, what that person will show up like. Will they be dominant? Will they be formal? Will they? What kind of behaviors will they display? And based on past history and success, we know what certain patterns are, who will do better in our organization one over another. Now, it's it's really hard when you need a nurse and you're trying to fill a spot and you have a really warm body at the table, but they don't fit your profile. So you, you have to um, really refrain from hiring those people because as we saw in the case studies, what happens is you end up with mediocre players, right? So in the Netflix story, they would say, you know, keep your top performers, but severance out your mediocre performers. Now, as my reasoning comes into play, I always say, well, we can't really afford to severance out all these people, Faith. <laughs> you know, so, so we don't. We, you, know, you hold on to the mediocres. But with using a screening tool up front, it helps us to identify who will those players be right on hire. It's not foolproof, of course, but it does help. OK, so on the third uh, part of our wheel here in terms of orientation and professional development. We know that high performance people are generally self-improving through experience, observation, introspection, reading, and discussion. And when I talk about this, I, I'm really emphatic about the, the style in which we educate our employees. We try to use varying methods because we know people learn in different ways. And so you really do need to consider all of those different things. Some people are visual people. Some people like to listen to webinars. And we try to offer a, a blend across the, across the board. So we have our clinical ladder. There are three tiers to the clinical ladder. Um, we have our level one, level two, level three. When they get to a level three, they really are our highest level skilled employees. They must meet a certain minimum number of hours of education. They must have the ability to mentor a peer. There are a lot of criteria. And they all must be competency tested in order to get to the next level. Our new grad nursing program, when we first put the new grad nursing program in place, what you'll find is the test happens, the nursing test happens a few times a year. They sit for their exam. And so what we try to do when we hire and we go through the process, we hire them prior to the time that they're actually licensed. And so their hiring is contingent upon that, but we begin our process two weeks prior because we put them through a skills, uh, um, a skills lab session. We bring them through some case studies that they have to accomplish. They um, have to write a case note for us, and they have to be competency tested. So they are hired for that week. If they do not pass their competencies, it is contingent upon their employment. So that's how we work our new grad program. We do also provide extensive education for our clinical managers. Um, I actually did a session on this with other colleagues um, at another conference just on the clinical manager role and educating them. And if you're not educating your clinical managers but said, you know what, you're a really good nurse in the field, so I think you should be a clinical manager, we have this all wrong. They come into those positions really overzealous and they're inspired that we've elevated and promoted them, but we forgot to teach them and train them all the things that they need to do in order to be a successful clinical manager. So it's one of the key things, um, the key programs that we have in our organization. If you're a clinical manager, you must go through the program and be competency tested as well. We also do a support staff training. We have annual skills labs by discipline. It's one of the, the um, you know, most popular uh, times that we do it twice a 
a year. All of our staff like to come to the clinical skills labs because we bring in vendors, we bring in um, case studies, we have a skills lab set up, and it really is uh, an opportunity for them to um, engage with their peers and to learn at the same time. We offer paid certifications in our organization. We do have wound certifications. We have a hospice and palliative care that we'll pay for. And if you come forward with an opportunity for a certification that would be, and I'll use their term, in the best interest of our organization, we will consider the certification to move someone forward. And of course, we do have a partner, um, one of our colleagues today who will be presenting from uh, Relias. Uh, we do offer online education and use that within our clinical ladder, within our orientation, with all of our requirements in terms of um, our accreditation standards and what we need to offer throughout the year. I'm just, I'm not going to go through all of these um, in great detail, but what I do want to tell you is that when we built our curriculum and competencies, we pulled together a work group and we identified skill categories for each of the groups that I just identified for you. We did um, a comprehensive list for each category and we validated the skills. We used outside resources. Many of you may have already uh, have a copy of the book, The Nurse Manager Survival Guide. That's something we use. It's published or uh, authored by Tina Morelli. We use that as uh, one of our um, resources and we conduct work groups with our team leaders to um, validate our exercises before we move them forward. Um, we finalized this training. We put together, and I talked about methods before, but we do webinar sessions, lunch and learns, interactives. We've even done scavenger hunts for people. They have to go find the information within a certain time period. We want to know that they know how to access data, how to access resources. Um, so we, we try to put all of these things together, joint visits, technical labs, and again, competency testing. This is just a sample of our categories for our home care clinician. They need different things than my new grads need. And my new grads need different things than my clinical manager may need. So, so we have different curriculums for each. Our support staff even have a di different curriculum. Again, we focus on customer service with our support staff. We want to make sure that they have good skills with our patients as well. Retention. Um, employee engagement, some of the things that we're able to do, I don't have a dry cleaner, I don't have a, a beauty shop um, in, in our organization, so I can't really do things like that. But we do put together a budget where our uh, clinical managers can take, they have a $25 budget per employee, and they do quarterly outings with their staff. We've had people go on picnics, we've had people do paint parties, they've gone out to dinner. Um, we've had, we have wine and beer tastings six times a year in the organization. I mentioned we have a very robust uh, new grad program. So those new grads, we wanna engage them and bring them in. It is not about the beer and wine, they get little sips. We really want them to be a part of the organization, engage with their peers and coming in occasionally. It's no longer okay to say just be out in the field because we think when we lose touch with them, we lose touch and we lose them. So we're looking for all opportunities to engage our staff. We have thanks cards where we give uh, gift cards. There could be $5 coffee cards. We could give Amazon cards to thank them. And of course, peer-to-peer -peer recognition. Our teams meet monthly and we encourage them. Tell me if you spotted someone in the field doing something nice. We acknowledge them through patient letters. There is no single greater way to acknowledge one of your peers than to say thank you. So whether your peer is doing it, whether a manager is doing it, I encourage all of my managers to thank their teams at the beginning and the end of every meeting because it is meaningful to thank people over and over and over again. Okay, so the metrics. I'm going to go quick because I know I'm running out of time, but we have five major metrics in our HR area. We look at the impact on retention, succession planning, productivity, profitability, and employee satisfaction. Within the first year of putting this program together, we had a 50% reduction in staff nurse turnover in one year. We reached a record low of our annual turnover. We were somewhere around 12%, where the rest of the nation and the regional benchmarks were at about 20%. My vacancy rates had, fell from, uh, had fallen from an annual high of 11% down to 7%. So within just putting together this comprehensive program, we were able to measure this very successfully. My employee satisfaction, 88% of my employees say they're 
um, they had a good experience with orientation. Overall working experience and, and satisfaction, 88%. Overall recommend agency to others to come to work for us is at 92%. We have room to grow. However, I think our scores are doing much better than where I started in 2012. High employee satisfaction leads to high patient satisfaction. It is absolutely proven. If you have happy staff, you will have happy patients. It has had a huge impact on our profitability. In the first year, we had a cost savings of $60,000 in the first year based on stipends and overtime alone with sustained uh, savings year over year. We had a cost savings associated with recruitment, and by recruitment, I mean just the outlay of um, our marketing efforts by $50,000. And in addition to that, I've had a cost savings of about 30%. Remember, on every employee you turn over, you lose about 30% on the rehire. It's had an impact on our business plan objectives from the ability to recruit talented staff, to plan for the future in our gaps in, in the workforce, to remain profitable and competitive, and ultimately putting the right people in the right place. Our bottom line results, we've seen positives in revenue, accountability, patient outcomes, um, employee satisfaction, We've seen less errors, less expenses, less vacancies, less turnover, and fewer performance issues, which is a real win for the organization. So, um, Faith, I don't know if you want to add anything else, but that is my conclusion. The, the point that we went through last talk is that every organization has to find their own culture. And that in healthcare, we have not really embraced that as uh, an element or a strategy necessary, but it is your corporate culture, and it is also your competitive advantage. And I leave with you a business, Harvard Business Review is, how is it that your local hardware store survives when Home Depot and Lowe's is down the street? You, you all have to think about that. In your own neighborhood, they might have specialized things. They might have better customer service. They might have a long-standing history. But when I need that one screw, I don't go to Home Depot. I go to the local. So that's what we're confronted with. So how do you want to define your corporate culture? These are some tools to mimic from others and go out there and build your culture. That's it. Thank you. Does anyone have questions or comments to? OK, I do. <laughs> I'm just so curious if you wouldn't mind commenting rather quickly. But um, was there any one piece of this whole plan that was the most challenging to ha get your leadership team behind and actually implement? One of the hardest things to do is to, um, when you're working with HR and their turnover is high and you have a lot of vacancies, they want to fill the seat. So you get a lot of people that apply and they want to take a lot of warm bodies, but you have to really stick to your plan. I mean, if, if I could say anything, that is the most critical piece. It's when your plan starts to fall apart and there's cracks in it. We, we lose our way, so you don't want to necessarily take the warm body, not have the bachelor prepared people, because every other piece of the puzzle then starts to slip. So that was one of the biggest challenges to make sure that people would not just put a warm body in that seat. Um, I would say that pro some people who've been with the organization for many years, their, their um, you know, compensation they were right on. What we really needed to do was bring up some of the new grads that came in. Once you get about two years of experience, they were the leveling was off significantly. So probably we have brought people up initially. It was between 5 and 7% that, 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 that whole nursing line had to come up. Correct. So uh, as you got to that two year point, were you kind of catching that by making sure that they were prescribed? Was that part of the law? That is part of the law. Yeah. To, to look at them and make sure that they are not. But I, I want to answer your first question a little bit more. Because we 
did piecemeal thinking, give you stipends. Please do more. Take another day off. The balance of the 5 to 7% increase was really minimized. And we used to supplement the orientation. We used to go to an outsource agency and bring in nurses at incredible rates. So I would step back and say, yes, there was an increase. But when you truthfully analyze all the other expenses and put them together, it was like this. So you're seeing reductions in other areas? Absolutely. We are mean and mean. We are not uh, a, a company with a lot of fluff in it. And our people are productive. They have caseloads. I can't tell you how many because they're too big. We know they're too big. So, but they're doing it. And, and uh, we have, you know, years I spent dealing with productivity measures, right? You have to do six, you have to do five. We don't deal with that anymore. It's a given. They fly with it. So that's the culture. And by the way, as a leader, I work just as hard as they do. They can see my light on at 7 p.m. at night when they're gone and drive by. So it's a culture throughout the organization to you know, come in, drive the business, enjoy your work, do what you need to do so you're on balance, a human being, and make it happen. And our bottom line has been very successful in a really gruesome industry. So that's really all right, thanks everybody. I know Faith and Lisa will be around if you want to talk with them later, but we do want to keep moving. Um, and um, I want to point out that one of the things that we're doing in today's session is actually going to use the next couple hours to dive a little deeper into some of the bigger points that we started with in the New Jersey example.